All right, number 311, and stand with me, please. Number 311, I'll give you a second. More about Jesus. We'll sing it on that first and last verse. All right. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died. Go ahead and sing on the second verse. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will to stern. Spirit of God, my teacher be. Showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me on the last. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Amen. I'm so glad you're back here this evening. What a wonderful crowd. Wonderful church service this morning. Uh, great preaching. Excited to see all the visitors and excited to see what the Lord's going to do tonight. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the day. We thank you for what you did this morning. Lord, we ask you to move again uh, tonight in the singing and in the preaching and the fellowshipping. Lord, I ask you to do a work. We thank you for working a among us, we do not take that for granted, and we ask that everything that is said and done here tonight we give honor and glory to you in your son's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Amen. All right, number 282, 282. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing. Wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon, coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day! Jesus is coming again on the last, standing before him at last. Trial and trouble all past, crowns at his feet we will cast. Jesus is coming again, coming again. visitors here tonight. Our ushers are in the back. They'd love to give you a visitor card. And if you have not received one, just raise your hand. We'll not embarrass you. And uh, we miss anybody? I think everybody's about regulars here tonight. Uh, well, good. Well, good. I uh, Just a little update on the Show Me Gospel Project. This Thursday, Lord willing, we will begin to, uh, we're going to stamp the envelopes. That way they give a little bit more of an eye appeal so they won't just be tossed. Uh, we're going to do a little something different next time with the uh, with the mailers, but uh, we have about 10,000. We're going to start stamping 10,000 on Thursday, and uh, then they'll all be separated, and then we'll get together in an evening and stuff them all, and we'll be excited about it and send them out and look forward to the next, okay? Praise the Lord.
Um, I'm gonna go rogue for a second. Um, stay seated. We sing Christmas songs early. Why don't we sing some Easter songs early? 262. We'll sing on that first verse. 262. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of... Sing it on the third verse. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Go ahead and turn to number 265. I'm going to make y'all have a little concert for Jesus. 265. Verse number two. Vainly they watch his bed. Jesus, my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord. Sing it out. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty power o'er its foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. All right, now. Number 345 and stand up, stand up. <laughs> One verse and we'll have fellowship. I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. While the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven. And shake hands.
my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to. On the second verse, I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not but God's angry frown. When the heavens opened and I saw that my name was written down, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. While the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for On the last, in the book tis written, saved by grace, oh the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know, by the blood I am made whole. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. While the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. Amen. All right. Wow. It's been some good music today, this morning and I. Nice little peppy, you may be seated. Peppy music, Easter's coming up, spring weather. How many get excited because the sun's out more? That's what I thought. How many of you are the one of those you get affected by the weather a little bit? You know, if it's a gloomy day, you kind of feel, yeah, there's a few of you raising your hands. Yeah, that's, a lot of people feel that way. So it's nice this time of year. The sun's out popping, and uh, what a blessing it is. Great service this morning. Thank you so much. I had a lot of visitors. I got a lot to write a lot of visitors' cards this week. And thank you for being good to Brother Brooks. Uh, I didn't say a whole lot about it this morning, but... He was a youth pastor for many years, and now he just became the pastor of a church. First time, he's only been at a year and a half, and he said he's very encouraged by this church, and he, he'd learned some things, and he's looking forward to, uh, to implementing some things. He just really enjoyed it. He was thankful he got to be here, so praise the Lord for that. Y'all guys, you all are awesome. All right, let's hear the youth choir sing. Come on. Oh! 
course of time. So many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds, and every one of them will say, without exception, that they find that Jesus never fails. Even in the days of old, he brought his peace. tonight. The Shawnee Baptist Church has a youth conference every summer. I'll be there this summer with a host of preachers in July. And Brother Ed Snyder, one of my favorite conference song leaders, uh, used to lead the whole course. And Brother Bussey was there with, at the time with Posen. And Jordan, you've been there. And the whole crowd singing, I'm amazed. About a thousand teenagers singing that song. Bro, it's beautiful. Beautiful. I'm telling you, man, one of these days when you really sink, sinks in with this, we're going to talk about tonight, that you're Gentile saved by a Jew, you'll crack. Because some folk just ain't sunk in yet. Maybe it'll take till we get to heaven. But can you believe that? I'm amazed that he would love me. Whew. Second Kings again this morning, Second Kings chapter, or this evening, Second Kings chapter 5. And uh, I'd like you to find your place there and let's stand together real quickly, if you don't mind, stretch your legs a little bit more and... Not real long message tonight. I do want to look at the, tonight I want to look at the Gentile Jew issue, just a little bit. God gives us a New Testament preview here in the Old Testament of how God actually feels about the Gentiles and tell you some misnomers that there are out there about this and, and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you and encouragement to you. So before we read this passage, are there any full-blooded Jews in this building tonight? 
I don't think so. In all my travels, I think I can probably only count on two hands how many times there's been a full-blooded Jew in, in the service. Very rare that they get saved. Uh, but if you, know, if you are a student of the Bible, you know what is coming for Israel someday. And you know that one of the smart things you can do as a born-again Christian is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. And that you are to bless Israel because when you bless Israel, God blesses us. And there's a lot of negativity about Israel because Catholics have taught us that. I'm just telling you history and doctrine. You, don't have to get, you can get mad if you want, but it's the truth. Because the Jews get blamed for crucifying Christ. And so we're not supposed to have any love or feelings toward them. Now they've disappointed God and as a nation, they have forsaken their roots. And if you read Romans 10 and Romans 11 and become a student of those two chapters, you'll learn that because of their negligence to God's goodness, Gentiles have the spotlight on us right now. God was always willing to help out a Gentile. Some of them in the Old Testament, some of them were in the lineage of Christ. But once you realize that God and his sovereignty and his power and his might just showed some interest in us and loved us, It'll change your life. Let me remind you, the Catholics, the Catholics are wrong. The Jews did not cru crucify Christ, nor did the Romans. Right. Nobody could. The Bible tells us he laid down his life. Right. He's all-powerful God. He raised people from the dead. He did that on purpose because of the song our young people just sang. So tonight we're going to look at that and how the Lord gives us a preview. As many say that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. <clears throat> so look at me in verse number one. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, Gentile nation, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. That was the theme of the message this morning. Look at this. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away a captive out of the land of Israel. So you have king of Syria and then land of Israel. And here's this lady from the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So here's a Jewish girl waiting on a Gentile leader's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. In verse number 14, again, jump down a few verses. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God and his Flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I, I, a Gentile, know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Little did he know he was making, I'll get to in this, now I'll go and tell you. He was making a prophetic statement that that God of Israel is going to be the God of the earth too. And he became the God of America at one time. God was going to spread and go global with the Gentiles. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. You may be seated, ladies, and come sing for us again. And uh, just thank it. While they're singing this song, God sent a full-blooded Jew to shed his blood for a dirty Gentile like me. Trust and give him all my heart in the dark. 
Thank you, ladies, for the blessing. Amen. So first, let's start off with the, uh, a little teaching, a brief teaching on this. Um, I, I'm not afraid to deal with this issue. I was blessed to grow up in a bicultural, bilingual world. So I have always been willing to embrace things that are different. So when I became an independent Baptist, and people sometimes said, this is the way certain things are supposed to be, I, I disagreed right away because, I mean, why? And, and I asked the question, why a lot? And America has a serious problem today with, with, with race, the race issue. It's still, and it's really globally, right? This race hates this race, and it goes back and forth, back and forth constantly. And I was blessed to grow up uh, with a father who was a very, very astute in the subject of cultural matters. My dad studied, his, it was part of his life and his, his uh, career, his passion was to expose the hearing world to the deaf culture. The deaf have their own culture, and it's... It's unique. It is very unique. And, and as always, it's just, it's like, it's like second hat with me. I just know when you get a preacher that comes, he visits. Today at lunch, we spent 15 minutes talking about the deaf in the church here. They were asking questions about it. Many of you aren't aware of this, but many deaf people actually have, uh, will get uh, car insurance discounts that hearing people don't get. Did you know deaf are better drivers than you all? By, by nature, they're much better drivers than hearing people. Because they see things long before you do and I do. See, we are a, a sound, responsive first. That sound is what causes us, that's the stimulus that causes us to respond first. The deaf are, are respond by sight first. So they will see an ambulance coming before we'll hear it many times. I'm just telling you the truth. I grew up with a dad driving all the time. And all my buddies would get nervous because he'd be sign, driving with one hand, signing with one hand, and going up through mountains and everything. And I was never in a wreck with him, man. He's an excellent driver. He just would see things. And, and the whole cultural thing is, is something that we, just, we have to get down to. And it's not about race in America. And I heard a black man say something very well, the other, very good the other day. He said, for a white man to not like a black man is to insult God's creation. And for a black man to not like a white man is to insult God's creation. Because God made you. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you look in the Bible today, the Old Testament is a nation emphasis book. The New Testament is an individual emphasized book, or, or, or section of books, the Testament. So the Old Testament, you see a whole lot of nations. I mean, think about it. Babylon, right? And Assyria and Assyria and Rome and, of course, Israel and Egypt. The nations and nations, they, they drove the world. Everything was about nation and kings and leaders and so on. Then you get into the New Testament and there's really just one king, and his name is Jesus. And now all of a sudden, God became flesh and allowed us as individuals to have a relationship with him. It's not so much about nations anymore, but about individuals. So if we were to want or desire a nationwide revival, we will never have it unless it starts as individuals first. And if you want church revival, it starts with individuals first. And we must put aside our pettiness and our, our, uh, our grumblings and our negativities and our critical spirit and, and just be excited with anticipation of what God has done, he is able to do. 
And so in my journey growing up in a bicultural, bilingual home, I learned that just because somebody else does something different doesn't mean they're wrong and you're right. I'll never forget my wife, when we first got married, she said, oh, the deaf culture can't be that much different than the hearing culture. And I just said, okay. It wasn't long until she was shocked at the difference between the cultures. As I've taken my wife on some mission trips, we went to the Bahamas for the first time. And the way they sing in the Bahamas would make many Christians in America very nervous. Oh, but it blessed my heart. I had no problem with it. You know why? Because it's their culture. And the music honored and glorified God. And I was stirred before I preached. And we get in this trap sometimes that our way is the right way. And you see it in this chapter right here. You see it in this chapter, a Gentile man of influence, he, he was trapped in his mindset. He said, I thought it should be this way. But once he was willing to humble himself and, and become cross-cultural and accept what a Jewish man of God, a prophet, told him to do, his leprosy was healed. I don't get nervous by this preaching. A lot of people do because, oh, you're talking about races. I don't get nervous. It's Bible. And if you want to talk about races today, there's only two of them in the Bible, Jew and Gentile, and that's it. So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And by the way, Gentiles come in all colors. Black, white, brown, pink, purple, polka. Sometimes, and by the way, they, they, white people should really be the colored ones because sometimes we're green, sometimes we're pale, sometimes we're, you know, we're blue. I mean, we're the ones that are colored, amen? And biblically speaking tonight, as you study the Bible, there's two Gentiles, or two, race, two uh, races, Jew and Gentile. As you branch that out and you look into the Gentile race, then you see there's multiple races with that in there and multiple cultures. And you even see the difference in culture in this particular passage here. But God has given us a preview. He's teaching us a preview of what is to come because as this little maid prophesied, there was another young lady, a, a little Jewish maid, who was summoned by God to do something miraculous. In fact, her name was Mary, and this little Jewish maid, so to speak, gave birth to the Son of God, and he would transform everything, and he, Jesus, would tear down all the walls between all the races and all the divisions in this world. Unfortunately, mankind has done a good job of putting those walls back and allowing our own stupidity, prejudices, stereotypes to separate us from potential friendships that could be life-changing. You want to reach the world with the gospel? Then you've got to realize the gospel is for the whole world. We're funny like that, man. We just are. I'm amazed at how even to this day Americans just, if we, we think it has to be done our way. My way is always the right way. Well, it's not, my friend. It's not. There's multiple right ways when it comes to this. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one gospel we preach. But the way we express those things and preach and teach them is sometimes is different. So here we are. Number one, I want you to notice. I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, you have a Gentile man in this story, powerful man, lots of authority, but a leper. You have a little maid, a Jewish young lady who had the answer, or at least knew where to get help. You have Elisha. He's a man of God, the Bible calls. The Bible calls him a man of God in this chapter. And he was the one who, who knew how to help this man heal his condition, and he's a Jew. And then you have servants I mentioned in this chapter. Servants, and they are Gentile servants. They are encouraged. They're the ones that encouraged him to do what was right and necessary. And by the way, can, can we look for some good old-fashioned servants again in America today? People that will encourage others to do what is right, to do what is kind, and to do what the Bible wants us to do. I mean, church, come on, it's been a couple weeks now since Missions do believe, and we heard the preaching, and we saw the video, and it stirred our hearts. But if, if we don't embrace this, if we don't understand that there's a God bigger than all these divisions and separations, we will never even come close to reaching the world. You've got to understand that. And then finally, the most important character of this story is God. Because God told Elisha what to tell him. And God was the one that the little maid knew would help him. And God got the glory from a Gentile man who proclaims him the God of the earth. So tonight, number one, I want you to give you a quick statement. I'm going to give you three quick statements tonight. I'm going to be an encouragement and bless you. Number one, notice this. God has been good to the Gentiles tonight. God has been very good to the Gentiles. I said God has been very good to the Gentiles. I said God has been very good to the Gentiles. 
You understand that Brother John's been going through the epistles now. And, and boy, I get excited when I read the epistles because in those epistles you learn that a Jewish man is teaching all these Gentile, look at this now, not nations. All right, remember the Old Testament's about nations? Egypt, Syria, Israel, Syria, Babylon. What are they in the New Testament? Oh, they're locations, but they are churches full of individuals. As God addressed the nations in the Old Testament, he addresses the churches in the New Testament full of individuals, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Ephesus, and he used a Jewish man who was a Pharisee of Pharisees of the eighth tribe of Benjamin, who was a rising star in Judaism, but he met Jesus, the glorified Jesus on the road to Damascus, and God tells him, you are going to be a preacher to the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 13, one time, when Paul continued to resist that a little bit, as he had such a burden for the Israel, he even said he was willing to be a curse for Israel. But one time, Israel's frustration caused him to finally say, I'm done. And in Acts chapter 13, he says, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And the Bible says this, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. You understand tonight, God has been good to the Gentiles. Here's what's amazing about this passage. In 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman discovers that there is somebody that could help him with his leprosy. He discovers that from a Jewish maid. So that was the first step of swallowing pride. I mean, we Gentiles, especially American Gentiles, think we're all that. And I, look, I thank God I'm an American. I thank God I was born here. I love my country. But let me remind you again, God is God before America was ever founded, and God will still be God when America's done. Amen. He's God tonight. We're not going to stray from the truth tonight. He is God. No nation has ever intimidated him. If anything, any nation that has initiated him to bless them in America has been one of them. Unfortunately now, we are losing those blessings because we have turned our back on God. But God has been good to the Gentiles. This man who's a leper finds out that he has a chance to get help. You see there in verse number three, it says, And she said to her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were this prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And God extends a hand of mercy in the Old Testament to a Gentile individual. The thing that's amazing about this is that this Gentile is going to be upset at first. The Bible uses the word rage. He was wroth. He was angry. He turns his back on Elisha's plan because of what I said this morning. I thought this and I thought that. And Paul addressed that a lot in, in, in the church age, in the epistles, because, boy, the Gentiles still had all their gods and they thought they could take Jesus and put him on the shelf with all their other gods. And Paul had instructed them, no, 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 you got to get rid of all those gods and put Jesus up there and him alone. And, and the Gentile pagan worship and the Gentiles and the whole issue of circumcision, that was a whole other subject. And the Gentiles had their traditions and their customs. And Paul brought the gospel to those people through the local churches and transformed many millions of people's of lives. And 2,000 years later, we still assemble in a Gentile church singing about a full-blooded Jew who died on the cross 2,000 years ago and rose again three days later to save this Gentile soul. Wow! God's been good to the Gentiles tonight. He's been good to the Gentiles. Very good. Number two. God helps Gentiles with their leprosy. It's different now. We don't necessarily have leprosy, although biblical leprosy would be much easier to deal with than the spiritual leprosy we're talking about. Spiritual leprosy is sin. I'll tell you something right now, the churches have strayed from preaching against sin. We strayed from preaching against iniquities and transgressions and breaking God's law. People don't have a fear of God anymore because sin is not preached on anymore. Sin is still in the Bible. It's presented. It's man's greatest problem tonight. It's our government's biggest problem. Our government is trying to solve all of these problems. Another stimulus bill, more debt, all these ideas, all these philosophies. When we get right down to it, there's only one way we can help mankind, and that is to tell them how to take care of their sin problem. And there's only one place that will do that, and that's Jesus Christ. 
We see in verse 13 of the same chapter, it says, And the servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. I love this. So what is, what, what is the real problem? What is the real issue when it comes down to this? Whether it's with race or, or accepting God's uh, uh, orders or commandments. It's pride. It's always been pride. When Satan tempted Eve, it was pride. When Adam fell, it was pride. Satan fell because of pride. Pride, pride, pride. The Bible says in Proverbs, God hates pride. All through the Bible, you'll see the theme of pride and pride and pride. And America has conditioned us to be very proud people, very proud of our successes. And this man, who had every right to be proud in the world's eyes, this Gentile had reached a level of success and fame. But every night when he went to bed, he still had to look down on his body and see the problem that was going to continue to haunt him, and that was leprosy. And God said, hey, in the midst of all of this chaos and all this rampant sin, every day when you look in the mirror and you're discouraged by the sin and the burden and the grace, Wait, wait, God says, I have the remedy. I have the answer. Jew or Gentile. Paul talks about that too. Jew or Gentile. So number one, God has been good to the Gentiles. If we're Gentiles here tonight, we should be grateful that he has extended the olive branch to us too. Except our olive branch looks kind of like a cross. Number two, God has allowed Gentiles to get their leprosy healed. And number three, because of those things, this is where we step up finally and do something. We make the proclamation that the God of Israel is my God. And I'm unashamed to say that. For Naaman to make this statement, don't, don't miss this now, this was a big deal in those days. Because in the Old Testament there was this there was this idea, all the nations, that there was a God in Israel. All right? Don't miss this now. But there was also multiple gods in all the nations around them. And the God of Israel looked very good and intimidating and imposing when the children of Israel made God the God of Israel. But the children of Israel in many cases, especially during Eli's days and King Saul's days, when when the children of Israel allowed Gentiles to rob them of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a type of the power, presence of power of God, when they robbed them of that, they mocked the God of Israel. And all of a sudden, it almost looked like the God of Israel had been demoted to the same level playing field as all the others around them. But when somebody declares him as God, giants fall. And in the midst of all that, when the ark of God was gone, David showed up as a young man, by the way, and said, The God of Israel will help me slay you, giant. And once that proclamation was made, the children of Israel were reminded, It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about our enemy. It's about putting God in his rightful place. And when Naaman stood up here, after he went in that river one time, and he comes back the second time, and he comes back the third time, four, five, six, every Every time he came out, he looked exactly the same as the first time he went in. But when he came out the seventh time, he looked at his flesh, and the Bible said it was like a child. Something happened there, and he stands up and proclaims one thing. Hey, 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 the God of Israel is the God of the earth. He's not ashamed of him. And this message was already prepared in my Bible before I even left this past Friday morning. But the man that was driving the bus, the shuttle bus that I talked about this morning, was a black man. And as I got on that bus, I'm telling the story again because it's good. As I got on that bus, it was packed. In the spring break week, it was busy airports on Friday. Saturday was not, but Friday was. And I had to stand up. He said, can you stand? I said, I don't mind standing. I put my bag up there and I grabbed the pole and he's driving. And he uttered the three simple words, praise the Lord. I said, you, you said, praise the Lord, you Christian. I already told you that. And he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, I'm going to preach. I'm going to go preach at a conference in Texas. And he said, what are you preaching on? I said, letting Jesus in your personal space. I'm telling the story again because some of you were in another ministry this morning. And he declares to the whole packed bus. There's 25, 28 people sitting on that bus. 
By the way, there was no social distancing on that bus that taking us to the airport. Come on now. Come on, America, wake up. Come, enough is enough, man, wake up. And uh, he said, hey, can I have your attention? This man is a preacher. He's getting ready to preach to, how many, I said about 200, 200, it was 250, 200 teenagers tomorrow about Jesus being in your personal space. Is he in your personal space? (laughs) You go, brother. (laughs) Boy, I tell you what, when one man speaks up, it's amazing how bold I became. I said, that's exactly right. Next, you know, we were testifying. And I want you to tell you something. The, The neat thing I liked about this guy you see, he was almost competing with me on how loud we could get. And he didn't know how loud I could get. The whole bus from that about eight, nine, ten minute drive to the, air, to the airport got to hear us testifying about God. What was that man doing? He was saying, the God of Israel is my God. He said, I've been driving bus for 30 years. He said, my boss knows I do this. He can threaten me to fire me all he wants. But what America needs is bold. And that's again, youth conference, bold. We need to be bold about our God. Boy, the transgender movement is bold. The homosexual movement is bold. The alcohol crowd is bold. The, uh, the, 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 the immorality and fornication crowd is bold. Hollywood is bold. Hey, Christian, it's time to be bold again. Where can I find that boldness? Here it is. We're Gentiles, lost and on our way to hell. But God's been good to us. He saved us from our leprosy. Hey, you are God. The God of Israel's is my God and your God. Wow, hallelujah. He is the God of Israel and he's my God tonight. You see him say there in verse 15 again. He says, and he returned to the man of God. He and all his company and came and stood before him. By the way, I think it's interesting that at first, he was upset because the man of God didn't come to him. He sent a servant. But at this point, Naaman's been very humbled. He was willing to go to Elisha. Yeah. He didn't stand at a distance and say, you come to me. No, no. He went to him this time. The phrase stood before him means a humble statement. He went before Elisha, humbled himself, and said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. He's saying, you've got the right God, and he's mine now. He's mine now. As Americans, we hate entitlement. As Christians, we practice entitlement. That's an oxymoron. Let me say it again. As Americans, we hate entitlement. But as Christians, we practice entitlement. Because even as Gentiles, we sometimes feel like God owes us something. And to that, God would answer simply this. Let's change that word, oh, forget that. Get that word out of there. I gave you something. And the God of Israel reached down to this lost Gentile and made it evidently clear that his 100% God, 100% man, son of God, would be my personal savior and redeemer. And that same person that saved me could save that black man who preached on that bus a better sermon than I did that day. Because he became his God. Who's your God tonight? Gentile friend, who is our God tonight? Watching online, who is your God tonight? Who is our God? Heads about eyes are closed. Thanks for listening so well tonight. Hello, Pastor Randy Dingen here at Bible Baptist Church. And let me take a moment and thank you for watching the message you just saw. We appreciate so much you supporting our ministry and being engaged with our church's activities. I want to take a few minutes and just talk about what our church really is all about. And that's making sure everybody we come in contact with, whether it's in person at the church or on the streets of our town, or even through the internet like this ministry, knows for sure they're going to heaven someday. You see, tons and tons of people have ideas on how you get to heaven. 
But it really doesn't matter what you think or what I think. It's what God says. A man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3 asked Jesus a simple question, a question that many of us wanted, a question I wanted for 18 years of my life. He asked Jesus about spiritual matters. And before Jesus quotes that famous verse of John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes Him should not perish but have everlasting life, He mentions to Nicodemus that the key to getting to heaven, or as He says in John chapter 3, the kingdom of God, is to be born again. What does that mean? Well, simply put, Jesus is simply saying this. Everybody has a physical birthday. You have a birthday, and I have a birthday. But God is a spiritual being. And so you see, if heaven is a spiritual place and God is a spiritual being, then a spiritual birthday is required to get to heaven someday. You don't get a spiritual birthday by a baptism, although baptism is good. You don't get a spiritual birthday by joining a church, although joining a church is good. You get a spiritual birthday by doing what Jesus says, not what you think, not what I think, not what you say, or what I say. Jesus tells Nicodemus the same thing he tells you and me today, and that is simply this. Ye must be born again. You see, Jesus Christ is the reason we can be born again today. You see, He came to this earth and for 33 and a half years lived on this planet. And He ministered for three and a half of those years. And then He died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And then three days later, He rose from the dead. And He defeated four enemies that you and I could not defeat. Death, hell, sin, and the devil. And in defeating those four things, you and I now, if we trust in His name for salvation, we are given a spiritual birthday, and then we know for sure we're going to heaven someday. So I've asked you the question today, you have a physical birthday, right? Of course you do. When is your physical birthday? Think about it right now. Now let me ask you a second question. When is your spiritual birthday? You see, I was born physically August 28, 1975. But July 17, 1994, after experiencing multiple baptisms, church memberships, I finally understood more here than here that Jesus Christ is all I needed for salvation. And on July 17, 1994, I gave him my heart. He saved my soul. I trusted his name. He forgave me of my sins. And I became a child of God. I was born again. So today let me ask you, are you born again? If not, please contact our church. We love you and we want to help you find the same answer we found one time. God is good. Contact us if you need us. God bless and make it a great day.